Unit tests are a great technique to add to your toolbox for evaluation. What I want to do today is walk through how you can use natural language unit testing when you're working on your generative AI apps. We'll go through how to build all of your unit tests, how to then evaluate them with LM unit, and then how you can interpret all those, whether you want to use individual polar plots or clustering to see group dynamics in that behavior. Now, before I jump into the code, I want to first start with giving you just an overview about how we should start thinking about unit tests in when we're working with evaluation. So let's think through some problems that we might have. We might have a use case where we're working for a financial institution and we want to make sure that the response is appropriate. And the information, of course, we have is the query, the question that we're being asked, and then how the models responded. And again, the key is, is we want to make sure that response is appropriate. Now, today I'm focusing on the response and making sure the style is there. I'll do a future video where we'll look at, is the retrieved information correct? But take a look at this question. We might want to ask, and we can see the model's response. Think to yourself, how would you evaluate this response? How would you make sure that it's meeting all the criteria that you have to around style to making sure it looks professional. Now we could ask the LLM to give a descriptive analysis of it. Right? Is this explained to you in the language of a financial analyst? That's one way. What I want to do today is argue that we can also, instead of one global question, we can ask very specific yes, no questions around the characteristics that we care about. In this case, I thought about my problem and really there's about six different axes that I care about. The context, the clarity, the precision, is it compliant, is it actionable, is there risks? And I built a unit test for each of those that asked a single question. I've worded these unit tests so the answer should be yes, which as we'll see, we'll have on a continuous scale as well. Now the thing is, is the reason you want to do this is if you use a global test, while it's great, these models can explain things very well. I love the explanations. But if you're evaluating 5, 10, 100, 500 of these, trying to read and read these descriptive results can just be a little bit overwhelming for this. So instead, the unit tests, as we'll see here, make it much easier to be able to work with these when we're starting to talk about scale, when we're starting to separate differences out. So this is a simple polar plot I made that helps me see how this response compares on all these different axes that I care about. And so this is why I'm advocating for all of you is as you're thinking about this, unit test should play a role in how you're thinking about your evaluation strategy. So I got you thinking about unit tests. What I want to do today is when you have those unit tests, we can run unit tests on individual samples. I'll show you how to analyze that. Those polar plots are nice. But as you have lots of evaluations you want to do, looking at each one can be a little bit too much. And so this is where I want to show you some techniques that when you have groups of unit tests, that we can use techniques like simple cluster analysis to get a better insights on them. All right, enough talking. Let's jump over to the code. Over in the examples repo, I have a notebook that we're going to walk through today for doing this. Now, the notebook is here. It's in GitHub. One thing I've done to make it easy, especially for you folks that want to test this out, is I've linked it up to Colab. So we can run this inside of Google Colab. If you're not familiar with Google Colab, it's a nice development environment that Google provides where you have access to CPUs, GPUs, in this case, we don't need any type of GPUs to be able to run on demand like that. So let's go ahead and walk through this. I'm going to hide away some of this pieces over here. I've tried to comment this notebook as best as possible. Um, so, but if you have any questions, let me know as well. So let's start walking through the notebook. First, we're going to inv in set up our development environment. Um, we need the contextual client because we're going to later, we're going to use LM unit. So this is where we're installing it for that purpose as well. So let's go through. 
we'll get that. I also need some several Python packages. And most of these packages really relate to some of the visualizations and um, clustering analysis that we're gonna do um, later. Now to use LM unit, you need a key, an API key from Contextual AI. We'll happily provide you the key for doing this. I will say you can do all this notebook without the key. You can use other models for that. As we, as I'll talk about when we talk about LM unit, I chose LM unit because it's state of the art for this particular task. But don't feel like the only way you can do this notebook is through that. So I'm going to go ahead and add my key here for the notebook. I'm going to do it right at the top and kind of hide that away. So I'm not giving you all my API key, but you get a sense of how to be able to add the API key to the environment. So next, I'm going to load an evaluation data set that I have. This is a toy data set that I've created to kind of give you a sense for the problem where we have a number of different prompts that come in and then we can see what the model's response is. And again, the problem is we want to make sure that these correspond to the styles, the characteristics that we want to come out of this. So we can take a look at those and feel free on your own to go through all of these um, as well. I'm going to kind of stick to the script here and keep us moving along. So now we have all these responses, but remember we want to build all those unit tests. Now, this is where we thought carefully about the unit test we want to build. This is an area where I'm a big advocate of learning to swim inside your data, looking at your data, spending time with your data. The unit tests I built for these, these will probably not be a good fit for your problem because you want to tailor the unit test to the characteristics, the things that you care about like that. So use this as a guide for inspiration, but know that you're going to want to build unit tests like that. And I know this is one of the hard parts. You have to be a little creative. You have to kind of push out on your own. There's no magic formula for doing this, but this is kind of the, the what you want to do to be able to get the most out of this type of testing. Because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is really just evaluate that it's a good fit for your problem that you're doing. And I don't know your problem. All right, so here's the unit tests I'm going to do. I have kind of a list of unit tests that I'm going to do. Now to evaluate these unit tests on those 10 different responses that I got, here's where LM unit comes into play. So LM unit is a model that contextual AI has trained that really evaluates these unit tests and it puts the evaluation yes, no on a scale of one to five. And then it's been trained specifically for unit tests. Now, you can use another model, you can use GPT-4, you can use a Claude to do unit tests. What we've done is designed a specific model just for this purpose and it works better than everything else um, like that. And there's a lot of customization where you can kind of add your own rubrics to it as well. So let me give you a sense of that. So we'll go ahead and ask a question here. And this is also why we installed the Python client earlier, so we have this nice command to do this. You can do this straight from the API as well if you don't want to use Python or if you want to instead do it in, um, let's say, um, JavaScript. So we have a question here. What is the material used in N95 tasks? And if you read the response here, this response here is long and meander thing where it goes through microfibers and it was chosen and particles are constituents of the universe a lot of excess information. And so when you ask, does the response avoid unnecessary information, it doesn't get a good score. It doesn't get a very high score, right? It gets a lower score around two, and that's because it's a meandering score. But this is a simple example of how a unit test works and how you get scored on that. Now, you can use LM unit to do much more kind of nuanced scoring where, for example, you can bring your own rubrics as well. So here, look at this, where we have a query and response, but I have very specific criteria that I've thought about. I can tell the model exactly this is the criteria and how you should score it like that. As you start working with your problems, this might seem like a lot, but as you start working with your problems and you start categorizing, hey, th this is the different categories we want, 
you probably will have some ways to describe exactly what is the difference between a three and a five for your particular one like that. So hopefully got you excited about using it. Now, I've written a little bit of a script here to take those uh, like six or seven unit tests that we have earlier, run them across all the different prompts that we have here. So this is just a little bit of nice kind of um, code that Claude made for me so we can run this unit test now across my data frame. So all of those other earlier prompts with those specific unit tests that I have. So let's go ahead and get this going. Now, this will take a few minutes to run because I'm running you know, six or seven unit tests on 10 different ones. But you'll see it's not super slow. The, the LM unit is pretty fast. It's faster than if you were just using kind of a traditional large language model um, to do this. So I'm going to pause here for a second and let this kind of run. Now, once that's finished running, we can go ahead and look at the results that come back. And I want you to take a look at this. So we have the prompt and response. We've known about that earlier. But now I have the results for each of my unit tests laid out where I can see, for example, where it's done really well on some of the unit tests, where it hasn't done so well. And again, like I have lots of different prompts and responses I have to do. So now I can apply the unit tests across all of those. Now, just looking at numbers like this, not so interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and just save out those results into a nice data frame. But let's visualize each of those individual results to just make it a little bit easier for us as humans to be able to see that. So I've got a little bit of code here to create a nice little plot. So we'll go ahead and run that. And so now you can see I've got a plot here where for this first one, that was the question was, you know, what are the current risks and outlooks for the, the sector? I can evaluate and I can see what the answer looks like on this nice scale where look at how, how it's working like that. Now, that was one. There might be a group of multiple plots that I want to do. And so I can even just run a kind of a quick command like this to run this across a bunch of different ones here. And now you can start seeing like, hey, th how this is interesting, how you can see where some model, some some prompts it did really well on for, in terms of style and some that it didn't do so well. Now we can start figuring out where the problem areas are in our data by doing this. So this is great when you're looking at those individual pieces like that. Now, as you get to more, you know, 50, 100 of these, looking at all these individual plots can be a little bit time consuming. So this is where a lot of times for when we're working with language, well, let's take advantage of clustering to help us understand kind of the larger sets of results. So here, what I'm going to do is I have a little bit of a data set that I've already prepared ahead of time where I've run a bunch of unit tests where it's not just 10 unit tests I've run. I've run 40 different unit tests. <coughs> or I've run, I've run, <laughs> sorry. I've run about 240 unit tests. It's actually across 40 different, um, 40 different queries. And of course, there's six axes here I'm using. You might have three. You might have nine, but I've, I've got about six axes here. So you can see these were about 240 unit tests I ran. I put all the data together. And what I want to show you is how we can just use data science 101 techniques, k-means and clustering. There's plenty of room to improve upon this. This is just a bit of a teaser to show you one way for how you can do this. But I'm going to cluster all of these um, together. So let's go ahead. Um, run that clustering code here and show you kind of what it looks like. So I run the clustering code and now we'll see each of these values has been put into a cluster. Now I've got a little bit of more code of like helping us understand what those clusters look like and how we can visualize those. This is again, pretty standard data science 101 code. So to start with here, I set my k-means for four that was appropriate for this data set. As with clustering, you might set a different number of groups that makes sense for your problem. But so in this case, I have four different clusters. So one thing I did was I took a look at 
all the different queries that fell within that cluster? And what were the patterns there that I can see and that I can understand from that, right? We understand the computer grouped them into a cluster. Well, what are the, some of the things that we're seeing here? So for example, we can see over here, right? Very high, very low over here, right? Similar here, we can see, you know, this is low over here, this is high here. And what we can do is we can start writing down what some of these things are like that. We can also visualize them in other ways, such as kind of using the two different axes to do that. But if you take a look at this, and I've put some code here to help us explain each of these clusters where we have those cluster centers and um, to do that. So for example, here we can see where the cluster centers were for each of the clusters. So now I can start seeing the differences between let's say context or clarity between clusters. <clears throat> and we'll see here, for example, for cluster zero, the strongest areas were clarity and precision, while the weakest were risk and compliance. Right. Cluster one, I can see it's a little bit different story. Now, this is where you have to come in with your knowledge by looking at these questions, looking at how the clusters are lining up and seeing, is there a story that you can put together? Is there a way that you can help explain what's going on here? Because at the end of the day, the goal of this is to be able to figure out where the issues were and to be able to solve this. And clustering is just a technique to help us do this at an aggregate scale where we have lots to do it. So we can use the numbers here to see some trends, but this is when then you have to come in with your interpretation and do this. And so I have examples of kind of how I interpreted these plots where, for example, the cluster that had very high clarity and precision, but low compliance and risk, I called that my compliance blind spot, where those queries, those responses were had clear communication, but were missing regulatory um, announcements. You can see here, cluster three, for example, has medium clarity, but low risk in context. So it was doing very clear communication, but it wasn't using the context, the information there. It wasn't assessing us of the risk. So it was what, what I think of it as a basic understanding without depth. So this is where you want to take advantage of the clusters to use this because later, right, we're going to take that information. We're going to use that to think about how we can improve our system prompts, how we can improve retrieval, how we can fix all those other pieces so we can get much better results at the end like this because this is where we want to go to. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Hopefully I've got you convinced and thinking about kind of how you could use unit tests. And you want to keep your unit test very focused, very specific. Don't try to crowd too many, too many concepts into one unit test. This is why we call them unit tests. They can be very kind of individually specific. Start with your knowledge of your data, with things that you care about. Here, I started with some global unit tests to get me a feel for seeing what are the patterns, where are the areas that there are kind of flaws like that. But jump in as you use unit tests, as you use LM unit, feel free to reach out anytime kind of with questions.